As you watch this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. I'm Rick Renner, and I'm sitting in the heart of ancient Ephesus, a place where people have been walking and looking at this city for thousands of years. During the time of the New Testament, about 250,000 people lived in the city of Ephesus. That's a lot of people. And in the middle of that thriving city, there was a powerful church, which we call the Church of Ephesus. The Church of Ephesus was a mission church, very involved in planting churches all over Asia. In fact, it was from here that churches were planted in Smyrna, in Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Laodicea, all around the region, all of those churches were born out of this church. So this was a very strategic church. But yet when you read Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4 and verse 5, the Bible tells us they had begun to lose their first love. Or after all those years of serving so faithfully, they'd begin to lose their excitement. What were they supposed to do? Jesus spoke to them and told them to repent. That word repent is such a key word. We repent to begin our Christian life, and throughout our Christian life, we will continually repent to get rid of things in our life that are wrong or attitudes that need to be changed. We need to know what the Bible says about repentance, what it is, we need to know what it isn't, and we need to know how to do it. Many people are confused about this word repent, but in fact, it's one of the most important words in the New Testament, especially for you and me, because we love Jesus. We need to know what it means to repent. The church of Ephesus was told to repent, and they did repent. And because they repented, they regained their excitement, they were once again fervent for the Lord, and they continued to be strong for hundreds of years. Today, I want to talk to you about this word, repent. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. I've been waiting for you, and today we're going to jump right back into Revelation chapter 2 to look at Christ's words to the church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus was truly an amazing church. As I told you in the introduction to the program today, it was a very strategic church because from Ephesus, churches were planted in the whole of Asia. And Christ had very important words to say to the church of Ephesus that still have relevance for you and me today. And that's what we're going to be looking at. But I want to remind you that I'm offering you my 10-part series called Christ's Message to Ephesus. It's based on these programs, but it comes with a wonderful study guide with all the Greek words that I use in these programs, along with the definitions, all the points, all the principles. It is just a marvelous study guide along with these messages. This would be great for your personal life or study with a friend or even in a Bible study group. And I want to encourage you to order it today. And we're also offering my big book called a Light in Darkness, Seven Messages to the Seven Churches. The director of the museum in Pergamum wrote these words. It's right here in the front of the book. One of the most professional books ever produced on these subjects. Wow, that is such an honor that that director would write that about something that I wrote. But the book really is amazing. It's 785 pages filled with full color pages, photographs, charts, illustrations, which really take you into the world of the New Testament. I found through the years that one thing people really like about my teaching is that I bring them into the context of the New Testament. That's what this book does. I wrote this book for that reason. When you step into the context of the New Testament, then you begin to understand better the words of the New Testament. If you know what the believers were facing, what challenges they had to deal with, why Paul said certain things, that helps you to understand the words of the New Testament better. And that's what this book is for. It will literally walk you into the ancient world so you can feel what the early church felt. And if you don't already have this book, I want to encourage you to order one today. This book will make a difference in your knowledge of the New Testament. And today I'm going to be reading from this book. But first, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 1. 
in verse 10 where we're beginning all of these programs. And in Revelation chapter 1, John is on the Isle of Patmos. And he tells us in verse 10 how he received the book of Revelation. And in Revelation 1.10 he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. We've seen that this phrase, I was, is taken from the Greek word genomai, which really describes a transition from one realm into another realm. By using this word genomai, John said, I transitioned from the natural realm into another dimension. And in fact, this word genomai carries an element of surprise. It really means this. I don't know how it happened. I could never replicate it in some way which I do not understand. I found myself transitioning from this dimension into another dimension. And then he describes the next dimension when he says I was in the spirit. When the King James Version, that word spirit is capitalized. But when you read this in the ancient Greek, it's a lowercase s, which means a better translation would be, I came to find myself in the spirit realm, or I found myself in a spiritual dimension. And when he entered into that spiritual dimension, he says in verse 10, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, verse 11, I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, and then he gives the list of the seven churches, beginning with the city of Ephesus. It says, unto Ephesus, then to Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Well, we've already seen that the city of Ephesus was strategic to the whole Roman province of Asia. It was strategic politically. It was strategic in an educational way. And it was strategic spiritually, because from Ephesus there were roads that went into the whole of Asia. And whatever took place in Ephesus eventually went to the whole of Asia. If you scored a big success in Ephesus, then the door was open for you to go anywhere you wanted to go in all of Asia. So in a certain way, you could say that Ephesus was the door to the entire province. It was the gatekeeper to whatever took place everywhere else. If you made it in Ephesus, then you could make it anywhere. Well, in a spiritual sense, this was good. That's why the Holy Spirit strategically had the Apostle Paul begin the work in Ephesus, not in some other city. Because if the gospel could be established in Ephesus, it would open the door for the gospel to go into the whole of Asia. And that is precisely what happened. The church was established in Ephesus, and then it went on to Smyrna, and then from Smyrna, the church was established in Pergamum, and then Pergamum was established in Thyatira, and then in Sardis, then in Philadelphia, then in Laodicea, all the way around. But it all began in Ephesus. But in a bad way, it meant that people that were spiritual opportunists were coming to Ephesus to try out their new revelations. They knew if they could score a big win in the church, it would throw open the door for them to minister freely in all the churches in the whole province of Asia. So the church of Ephesus, which was the most notable, the biggest, the most powerful, influential of all the churches, was literally being inundated, excuse me, but with weirdos that were coming from all over the Roman Empire to try out their revelations because they all knew, hey, if we can make it in Ephesus, the door will be opened and we can travel freely everywhere with our ministries. So they were being inundated with people coming with all kinds of new strange revelations, even many people claiming to be apostles, and they discovered that they were not. Now, that leads us to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1, Jesus' words to the church of Ephesus. He says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, and who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now I'm going to refer to my notes, because today we have a lot of territory to cover. Look at verse 2. Jesus says, I know thy works. The word know, again the Greek word oida. This word oida means to see to behold, it means to perceive, to delightfully view. It describes a scrutinizing look or a look with the intent to examine, to fully view, to experience, or to know something from personal observation. Oh, this is so very important because what Jesus is about to describe is not something that somebody told him in prayer. It's not something that an angel reported to him. Jesus, we know from verse 1, has been in the church. He's been walking in the midst of the church. And now the word oida means he's seen things with his own eyes. 
And what he's going to describe now is what he has really looked at. He has examined the church. It's been a scrutinizing look. He's delightfully viewed them, and he's seen them some things that are disturbing. And now Jesus, Oida, speaks from his own personal observation. He says, I'm going to tell you what I know about you. I know your works. The word works, being the Greek word erga, it describes the total output of a person's life, or I like to say it like this, it describes actions, deeds, or activities. It could refer to the total efforts of a person's life, his occupation, his labor, his profession. It denoted the result of hard work or labor. It was so all-encompassing that it pictured all of a person's actions, beliefs, and conducts, or everything about a person. It was the equivalent of saying, let me tell you what I know about you because of my own personal observation. I know about all your erga, all your deeds, all your activities. There's nothing about you that I do not know. I know it all. I've walked in the midst. I've walked around you. I've observed you with my own eyes. And now I'm going to give you a report of what I know about you. Likewise, Jesus knows about you and me. He knows about your church. Jesus loves us and he loves the church. And Jesus is still in the midst of the church observing what is going on. But what did Jesus know about the church of Ephesus? He said, I know your works and your labor. That word labor, the Greek word kopas, which describes the hardest, most wearisome kind of labor. It could describe toil, fatigue, or one who gives everything to a project or assignment. What a compliment. Jesus said, one thing I know about you, when you make a commitment, you make it all the way to the end. You give everything to every project and every assignment that has ever been committed to you. This word kopas, the word labor, could describe someone that is weary or exhausted because they have worked so hard. They've given every fiber of their being to a project. This is a word we would, we would want Jesus to use to describe us or our church, a hard working church. When we make a commitment, we really make it all the way to the end. This was a great compliment. But that's not all that Jesus said. Jesus said, I know about your labor and I know about your patience. The word patience is the Greek word hupomene, this marvelous, marvelous word that is used all over the New Testament. It's very important that Jesus used this word to describe the church of Ephesus. The word hupomene means to stay or to abide. But listen, to remain in one spot, in other words, I'm not going to move, this is my spot, I'm not budging, or to keep a position, to not surrender it to anybody else, to resolve, to maintain territory that has been gained, this is very important, because the church of Ephesus had gained a lot of territory, and this word hupomene, here translated patience, tells us they were staying in their spot, they were keeping their position, they had resolved they would not surrender the territory that they had gained. But in a military sense, this word patience, the Greek word hupomene, was used to picture soldiers who were ordered to maintain their positions even in the face of fierce combat. To defiantly stick it out, regardless of the pressure mounted against it, endurance. It is staying power, hanging their power, or I like this, the attitude that holds out, holds on, outlasts, perseveres, hangs in there, never giving up. Every opportunity to surrender, they pass. They turn down every opportunity to quit. It is the picture of one who is under a heavy load, but refuses to bend, break, or surrender because he is convinced that the territory, promise, or principle under assault rightly belongs to him. It can be translated stamina or durability. The church of Ephesus was a church under assault. They were under assault because of persecution, and they were under assault because they were be, being inundated with people showing up from everywhere trying to test out their revelations. They were under assault, and their temptation was to be tired, they were working very hard. We already saw this from the word labor, the Greek word kopos, the hardest, most wearisome kind of labor. But in spite of it all, they had made the decision, we're not bending, we're not breaking, we may be under a very heavy load, but we're not surrendering our spot. This is where Christ has called us. This is what he has told us to do. And like soldiers, we're not moving from where he has called us. We're not going to back away from what he has told us to do. They were the gatekeepers of Asia. They believed it was their job to maintain doctrinal purity in their church 
and in the whole of Asia, and they would not surrender this under any case. And Jesus says, I know thy works. Oh, and the Greek actually says, I know the works of you. The grammar is very different. I know the works that are unique to you. You're very special. Then he says, I know your labor. And the Greek says, I know the labor of you. I know your labor. It's very specific to you. It's unlike any other church. Then he says, I know your patience. And the Greek again says, I know the patience of you. It's unique to you. You're very different. You're in a category all by yourself. The way you endure, your patience, your staying power, it is so unique. These are all compliments. And Jesus is not done yet. He goes on to say, and how thou canst not bear them that are evil. The word bear is the Greek word bestadzo, which means to bear responsibility for something. The word evil is the Greek word kakos. The word kakos describes something that is evil, vile, foul, or destructive, something that is unacceptable in thought or action, actions that are harmful, hurtful, or injurious, or an action done with evil intent, actions or attitudes that result in damage or ruined in one's life or in the life of another. So someone is trying to do something in the church of Ephesus that is ruinous. It's evil. It's foul. It's vile. It's horrible. And Jesus says, you refuse to endorse it. You will not bear responsibility for those that are doing evil things. Or as we've seen, this Greek word kakos means those who come with evil intentions. Who in the world is Jesus talking about? He tells us in this verse. And how thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. When Jesus says which say they are apostles, this phrase which say would be better translated. They are asserting themselves to be apostles. They're pretending to be apostles. They're alleging to be apostles, but they are not. And you have found them to be liars. The word found is the Greek word eurisko. This word eurisko is a Greek word which means I find or I discover. But listen, it is a discovery made as a result of careful observance. A moment when one makes a surprising or conclusive discovery. It usually points to a discovery made due to an intense investigation, scientific study, or scholarly research. And here's what we know from history and we know from this verse. When people arrived in Ephesus to test out their new revelations, the leadership of Ephesus understood it was their job to test these people to see whether they were real or whether they were bogus. Rather than just throw up in their arms and say, we're glad that you're here, we endorse you, please go anywhere in Asia and minister, first they tried them. That's what the verse says. Jesus says, you tried them. The Greek word perazzo, oh my goodness. The word perazzo describes an intense examination. An intense examination. It describes the intense examination that was used to test to coins, usually, to determine if they were authentic or if they were counterfeit. So the leadership of the church would say to a newcomer, we're glad that you're here. Let's get to know you. And they would begin to test them. They would talk to them. They would examine them. They would probe them doctrinally and spiritually, trying to find out, are these people authentic or are they counterfeits? Are they real or are they bogus? And the problem was a lot of people were claiming to be apostles. Why were they claiming to be apostles? Because apostles have great authority over people and over entire territories. People with ulterior motives wanted power so they could control and manipulate people. And people were showing up claiming to be apostles and the Bible says they were not. And the church of Ephesus found them to be liars. That word found, again, the Greek word kurisko, which means an intense examination, their result in some kind of a euphoric discovery. Bam, we found it. Yes, Eureka, now we understand. We finally got to the heart of the matter. Even though they sound right, even though they feigned to be so spiritual, we dug and dug and dug until finally we discovered the truth. They were counterfeit. They were not authentic. And in fact, when the Bible says you found them to be liars, the word liars is the Greek word saudes, which really could be translated, you found them to be pretend apostles or you found them to be bogus. That would be a very good translation. But in spite of all of this, look what Jesus says to them in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4. In Revelation 2, verse 4, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because 
thou hast left thy first love. Now I'm going to read to you from page 444 in this amazing book. Again, if you don't have it, you need to order this book. And on page 444, we find that this word never, nevertheless is a translation of the Greek word Allah, which is simply means but. However, in spite of all the good things I've already said about you, I have something I need to address. Wow, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. What does that mean? Thou hast left thy first love. And how could this church, which was so powerful, this church, which was good on so many points, how could they leave their first love? Well, the Greek sentence structure of this verse is very different from what we read in the King James Version. The original Greek literally says, because your love, the first one, the first one you have left. Wow, this is amazing. When it says the first one, it could be translated the early one. Jesus was referring to what they were like when they first repented and came to Christ. Listen to what I've written. Jesus used this phrase to remind the church of Ephesus of the esteem, awe, admiration, wonder, and appreciation that was first wakened in their hearts for him when they received him as their savior many years earlier. Like young people who fall in love, the Ephesians fell hard when they came to Christ. Their hearts were captivated with their love for Jesus. They were no limits to what they would surrender to him, no boundaries to their obedience. They were willing to sacrifice or leave everything behind to follow him. But by the time John saw Christ on the Isle of Patmos, more than 30 years had passed, and Christ issued them this stern warning. Your love, the first one, you have left. The phrase you have left is from the Greek word aphiemi, which denotes the voluntary release of something once held dear, or to neglect, to ignore, or to leave something or someone behind. And here's what happened. The church of Ephesus became so involved in the machinery of ministry, like many of us do, that they lost the wonder of it all. What they felt when they first came to Christ, the wonder of it all, the awe that was in their heart, their willingness to sacrifice anything for Jesus, they were still committed. Jesus just said to them, I'm so impressed with you. I know all about you. I know about your labor. I know about your work. I know about your patience. I know all these wonderful things about you. I know how you desire to have doctrinal integrity and you try them that say they're apostles and they are not. All of these are such wonderful points. Then you come to verse 4 and he says, Allah, but however, I have one thing against you. In the midst of it all, all of your busy activity, all your ministry schedule, you have become so busy that you have lost the wonder of it all. The Greek word aphiemi, here translated left, you've let the wonder of it all slip through your fingers as you have become lost in the busyness of a ministry schedule. And Jesus commanded them to remember what they used to be like and to repent. Jesus never wants us to lose the wonder of it all. We're to maintain that awe in our hearts of how wonderful it is to know the Lord and to serve Him. And when we begin to lose the wonder of it all, Jesus holds that against us. That's what we read in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4. How do we get it back? How do we get the awe and the wonder back again? That's what we're going to see when we come back. We're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. The Bible comes to life like never before with Rick Renner's book, A Light in Darkness. Step into the world of the New Testament as Rick Renner transports you to the ancient cities of the early church, revealing the relevance of Jesus' messages to the church then and why those messages still resonate for his church today. Rick reveals insight into the ancient world and the disturbing realities the early believers faced as the church began to flourish in a pagan world with unsurpassed detail fascinating insights and historical context you'll have a greater appreciation and understanding of scripture and how you should interpret it for today this beautifully bound 800 page full color biblical resource can be yours for 80 dollars features on location photography with added artwork and illustrations to enhance the in-depth scriptural teaching that makes the new testament come alive 
when you call or go online today. You can also get Christ's Message to Ephesus, an in-depth 10-part teaching series that delves deep into the message Jesus gave to the Ephesian church. The church of Ephesus was a successful church on the outside, but they had drifted from their first love of Jesus. Available in digital or physical format, starting at just $20. Rick uses this teaching series to remind you to return to your first love of Jesus. A light in darkness and Christ's message to Ephesus. Call now or go to renner.org to order. Friends, this is Rick Renner. Now, right now, I'm in the interior of the Moscow Good News Church. It is quite an amazing place. When you walk through this building, it's so beautiful and it testifies to the grace of God and the provision of God and the giving of our church and of our partners. We built this facility debt-free and because of that, the Moscow Church has never had the burden of monthly payments. All of our funds have been released to do the work of the gospel. And now we need to do that in Tulsa and I call this phase three. And I'm asking you today to pray about joining us as part of the giving team for phase three, which is paying off the Tulsa facility. And the reason we want to pay it off is because then it will release funds for us to take the teaching of the Bible to the ends of the earth. And dear friend, right now, the Bible is so needed. And I know that that's my heart and that is your heart. And together, we can take the Bible to the ends of the earth. So please pray about joining us for phase three to finish paying off the Tulsa building. And I want to say thank you in advance. In Revelation 2, verse 4, Jesus said to the wonderful church of Ephesus, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. It's very important that Jesus said, I have. The Greek word echo, which means to hold something in a very personal way. What Christ was about to describe, he felt very personally. He said, I feel it. I personally feel it. This is something that I feel. What did he feel? He said, I have somewhat against thee. The word against, the Greek word kata, and describes a downward strike. It's the equivalent of saying, with all the good things that I've already said about you, there is one strike I personally hold against you. What was it? He said, because you have left your first love. The Greek actually says, because your first love, the early one, your first romantic preoccupation with me, when you had the wonder of it all in your heart and you were captured with me and you loved me and were enthralled with me, somehow over the years and in the midst of all of your busy schedule, You've left it. And that word left, the Greek word aphiemi, which means to release something probably involuntarily. They just became busy, and through all of their busy schedule, that wonderful awe they felt about Jesus began to slip through their fingers, and now they had been reduced to a big ministry machine. And Jesus said, with all the good things I've said against you, this I really hold against you. If we've lost the wonder of it all, we need to get it back. Wow. I want to remind you that I'm offering you my series called Christ's Message to Ephesus and my book called A Light in Darkness. Order it. But Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would capture our hearts and return us to that early love we had when we first came to Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with me. Remember Ecclesiastes 8, 4, where the word of a king is, there's power. Let God's word release its power in your life today. And I'll see you in the next broadcast. If you enjoyed this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.